Pretty Pony is presenting Ghost on the Wire, Check the Air. What happens when the network defenders get so good that you can no longer do command and control over the network without being detected? When your job depends on it, you get creative and do it out of band. Here's an interactive short story to talk about off the wire command and control and how you too can do it for fun. A more pragmatic approach and what to look for if you're defending. Hoody Pony is with DEF CON Group 11613 in Melbourne. I have to say that right. Melbourne, Australia. Uh, Hoody Pony is just a friendly local cybersecurity Sherpa helping people verifiably build and a safer, secure, and more resilient world by sharing knowledge through telling stories. This includes the privilege of presenting here at DEF CON Group VR Village previously and taking and a keynote at CHCon New Zealand. Amongst many other conferences, uh, Hoodie Pony is grounded by many years of experience spent uh, security advising and assessing critical infrastructure in Australia and governments to small startups, uh, to small startups, sorry. That said, Hoodie Pony is just another nerd figuring out how things work, tinkering and challenging assumptions sharing a story so that we can make all better, all make better informed decisions through broader perspectives. So with that, take it away, Hoodie Pony. Thanks, X-Ray. Um, can any, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yep. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. So good day. Um, just a noob here, uh, learning things. And so just put together this little interactive short story because it's fun to share some shenanigans. So do jump in and participate. With that, let's go. Good day, agents. Welcome. We will be brief. As you have noticed, we have a bit of a problem. Our mission to control all is kind of under threat. The wires are being watched and defended increasingly well. This is preventing us from exerting our control. Emerging technologies are making it really hard for us as more sophisticated detection techniques are increasingly detecting and responding to our command and control, or C2 mechanisms. Our FBC operators' command and control channels of our subjects are being disrupted by improved detection and response mechanisms, include network flow controls, more advanced environmental monitor ring of Wi-Fi signals too. So for us to succeed in our mission, we must become ghost on the wire. Hmm. So we talk. What if we were never on the wire? Can we will we become ghost in the shell? After some work, here's something we cooked up. So switching over to a live demo, praying the demo gods uh, bless this. Let's see how this goes. <laughs> okay, it looks like screen sharing kind of works. And yep, that, that shows up. Okay, so what we have here is um, your standard Parallels VM. Uh, what I'm going to draw your attention to is that I have turned off, we have turned off the network on this. So the network's disconnected. And from this, you could also see that the Bluetooth is disconnected. So just to prove that network's kind of off, let's uh, get into that and just to prove that there is no keyboard input. Um, I wanted to do this with a camera to show that hands off keyboard. But what we're going to do here is um, with no network connection necessary, um, let's do a couple of things. So we've just done that. Um, hi, 
Looks like the demo is working. Yeah, that works. Cool. So, hi, DEFCON Village. So, what we can, what we are seeing here is that, you know, let's prove that there is actually no network connectivity on here. Um, let's do that. So we could see, you know, by running something like that's your standard IP link show, everything's kind of down. There's nothing up. There's just a loop back being up. Um, yeah. And look, ma, no keyboard. But, you know, it's hard to say with a screen share, right? So, uh, Let's do something live, maybe this, and we get the real time, time, yeah, yeah. So that's that's the current time in UTC because UTC rocks. Um, anyone wants me to, you know, type something to prove that this is a live demo and that is not a video recording? Um, I can do an echo of something. Um, what do you want me to say? Banana. Banana? Okay. Let's do that. Let's do an echo of the word banana. If I can spell that properly. But, you know, we see that on screen. So that's a live demo for you. Um, but, you know, let's be honest, if we want to exit control, we probably want to, you know, do something a bit more uh, useful, maybe. I don't know. Like, say, something like that. Or, you know, we could, we, but, you know, we can always just do more, right? Um, besides just listing and stuff, we can say, do that. Oh yeah, that went out of time, but oh wells, that kind of works. But, you know, let's, try simulating something more useful or um, exerting more control. Let's say we do that. And without the network, let's give that a moment. Bam. Well, that's standard Hollywood, but we can see how we can potentially expand that to do more interesting things. So that's the end of that live demo. Uh, here I'm doing simple actions, but you can definitely extend this to do additional, more interesting commands. Um, so let's stop that live demo uh, and drop that. Now let me go back to slides. So that was the POC. Um, what do you think? Oh yeah, feel free to leave your mics unmuted if you want. It's interactive, so. Excellent. Um, yeah, demo gods kind of worked, so we don't need to use that thing that we prepared earlier. Um, so, what the heck just happened? Anyone want to guess? Edward hacked your computer. <laughs> well, that could have happened. That's definitely possible. You're playing chess with Edward? <laughs> Any other guesses? No? All right. Let's start with the first hint then. It's wireless, but I'm clearly not touching the keyboard. The thing in bottom right, that little text box which I highlight, but if I type anything or touch the keyboard, that would 
you know, that would have removed the highlight. If I move the mouse, you would have seen the mouse move. So I'm not touching the keyboard, no hands, and I'm kind of away from the computer. It's wireless, but let me just call it out. It's not cellular. Um, just a note, yes, the thing on the bottom, which says that this is just a pop. If you're actually doing this for real, use 4G, but I digress. Now, <laughs> any guesses? No? Huh? Okay. So, like I said, it's not Bluetooth, it's not Wi-Fi, but I explicitly showed that it's not that. So, what else could it be? Um, there's a lot of things. <laughs> there's a lot of things, right? There are the wireless protocols. Yeah. Um, but what you see on screen is mostly used for things like IoT, smart lights, smart switches, others. Um, like Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, these are also in the ISM, or the industrial, industrial scientific and medical radio spectrum. It could be this. Is it this? Uh, what about ultrasonics and infrared? Hmm. Well, uh, this is running um, within that VM. It's not that. So. When I see it on an SDR. You see it on an SDR? What? Like if I had a waterfall frequency display up when I see something fly by. You probably could. You will see it on an SDR. Yeah, because it's uh, it's RF. We did say that it's wireless. Yep. So. Question is, what kind of wireless? Mm hmm. But how? Okay, it could be this, but uh, let's just say it's not. How about pages? <laughs> Old school, but it works. <laughs> yeah, right? Um, as pages, pages are kind of infamous for the sensitive information leakage, especially sensitive medical information stuff because, well, it's still quite widely used. If you did try to guess pages, that would be a good guess. Well, so if we take a closer look at the messages on screen, as we can see from here, automated systems from various things, uh, including large consultancies, do use it for comms. And it's been observed that there are systems which use pages for command and control. So that would actually be quite a good guess if you were thinking about it. But, you know, since I'm talking about this and saying this, well, it's not. So before I move on to the next slide, any else, anyone wants to guess? No? Yes? I'm looking around for uh, guesses. No? OK. Let's move on then. Um, well, defenders in mature organizations are getting better at detecting and responding to this as they are increasingly becoming ubiquitous. And well, with pages every few years, they make the press and there is an outrage. So this means that defenders in more mature organizations know how to detect, deny, and disrupt our C2. We can't really have that, can we? So especially because this larger, more mature organization is exactly where we want to be in. So how do we? How did we do it? Well, we use the protocol that is not on the ISM, uh, the um, not on the ISM spectrum, because it's common, and it's also a very congested RS space. So, much organizations would kind of be looking at it. It's never on the network. So, if there's no PCAP, all your NDRs, all that magic sauce, doesn't quite work, does it? Well, but the total number of people that can legally use it is quite limited. Um, it's rare, 
so I mean it's unlikely a priority for most defenders to mitigate. Wait, am I blocking? Yeah. So what we did here was we did an out of band command and control via APRS. Yep, we could have started with this slide, but where would, where would be the fun, right? <laughs> so let's talk a bit about APRS. APRS is a real-time tactical digital communications protocol for exchanging information between a large number of stations covering a large local area. It was initially developed at the U.S. Naval Academy by Bob uh, Bruninger. Um, it was used for tactical messaging and position tracking, including by FEMA. It is now a global amateur radio comms network built on top of AX25. On two meters in the US, it's on 144.39 megahertz. In Australia, the national network is operating on 145.175 megahertz. It is within the amateur radio license spectrum. I'm going to use the Australian examples here because I'm from DCG 11613 in Melbourne, Australia, so we'll go with that. APRS goes way further than you'd expect. Um, this does serves as an alternative sufficient enough comms network when cellular is down. As you can see here from Melbourne, we're making contact with stations over 200 kilometers away. Besides satellite, cellular, and say the internet, very few protocols do communicate over such wide distances. Well, we have a few other digital protocols, but let's set that aside for a moment, um, like DMR and stuff. Um, today, APRS it, or a variant of it, specifically it's used by ships and AMs for position tracking and communications, including various weather reports. But you know, the usual disclaimer before we go further and I show you how to actually do this, um, these are within the license spectrum. So please don't really attempt, don't attempt without a, amateur radio license or without supervision of one, whatever is according to your local rules. Um, so get a ham license. Uh, Gibio did a good talk last year at this venue as to why hackers should get a ham license. This is one reason why. It's, it's kind of illegal to transmit without a license. So um, this is just a fun talk, uh, proof of concept talk to talk about RF and non-IP based networks. It's not really practical. Use a 4G modem, it works a thousand times better. We'll talk about it later. But yeah. Um, and as you can see in the next slide, uh, these messages are public and monitored. Um, under the HAM license uh, rules in Australia, we are not allowed to encrypt our transmissions uh, without explicit authorization from the regulators. So everything is in plain text. Um, if you'd like to chat more about it, or try APRS messaging out, talk to your local amateur radio group. With that, let's get back to it. So here's how to do it yourself, especially if you have a ham license. Um, just a note, surprisingly painful, but yeah, let's go. That one, get your license. Um, ARL, for those in the US and in those in Australia, WIA has really good starting guides. Um, what we are covering here is, uh, you know, just get a RTR SDR and a TX capable radio. Uh, we're not going to dig too deep into what uh, transmit capable radio because uh, that's a very long conversation. Um, have that with your local hand group. Um, you'll need a Linux based computer, example, Raspberry Pi or something, um, some free open source software, and we are going to use APRS Droid and Android app. Uh, we are covering, covering the configuration details here as really during my journey of this, it wasn't as clearly available as it really should be. So hence sharing that. Okay, so start by installing these. Um, then what you want to do is create a direwolf config file with the following details. Um, you will need to replace that 
your call sign with your own call sign. And as that will get transmitted with your um, messages. Next, we run RTLFM to listen to your appropriate frequency. Uh, I'm using 145175 um, and point direwolf to the config file we created earlier. Um, and if you're in the US, adjust this to 144.39. Next, create a mini program to read all that APRS message and execute them. Bring it on C2. What you really need is just that small program. Um, what we do is it reads the APRS messages from the log file or pipe and executes the stuff you want. This could be something like Cobalt's right? Metasploit, whatever you want, or even a custom ransomware worm, whatever. Um, what I've done here is just barely enough for POC and illustrative purposes only. So we're going to skip past the actual C2 that I used. Run that little C2 that you have made um, and wait for that command. And you pull up APRS Droid, configure that, and send your messages. Um, control whatever you need to. Uh, we're going to skip, as I mentioned, skip the TX radio setup parts because it, it gets really complicated. Um, let me just move to the side so that, yeah, there we go. Yeah, so more details on how to set that up is available at that link on the screen. Um, or talk to your local ham, uh, ham radio group. Or, hey, the ham radio village is running. Go check them out. So maintain control, go hack the planet, I guess. Uh, good luck, have fun. But that's not pr practical. I don't want to get a license, fine. <laughs> so let's talk about the 4G, 5G alternative and the more sensible Dropbox to use. Well, an option is to use an overlay network like Tail scale is zero tier so that it will do the whole magical net hole punching thing. And you'll be able to avoid, uh, be able to connect to it despite the changing IP address that typically comes with a 4G or 5G uh, network. Or use any mature C2 that handles that well. However, having something that's integrated into our organization's uh, authentication and authorization system allows us to keep tight control over who has access to the C2. So what can we use? Well, you might have seen this in a glitch video, which um, he has done with a few, uh, with Hack5. Um, it, this device doesn't do tail scale out, out of the box, so some hacking is required. But in the hacker spirit, this bad boy can do so many things. The Raspberry Pi is still the GOAT. We just need to add a 4G, 5G hat, and we're good to go. Or if we want to get spicy, swap out that tail scale with Cloudflare for um, some DNS over HTTPS fun that brings you. And um, all the joys blocking Cloudflare. But that's for a future version. So, right, the problems, right? All that is all good and all, but um, how can our targets actually mitigate it and stop us from actually accomplishing what we want to do? Let's talk about that so that you're aware. One of the best defense is still defense in depth. If at the end of the day, we connect to the void, it's still the void. We still get nothing. So that would be pointless. Some controls that might raise the difficulty for control um, for us to control is um, network segmentation, like using VLANs, um, mutual TLS on your NACs, um, doing physical network separation, air gaps, implementing a network access control, uh, MAC address allowless, 802.1x, et cetera. This controls most mature organizations should have them and should be good enough and already makes like rogue devices, like what we are trying to do here, getting onto the network really hard. By de denying entry into the network and segmentation access, that kind of limits our area of control. But, well, 
you know, this is an RF talk. So what if they have RF defense? I'd say, yeah, it's kind of unlikely as it's quite costly to implement. Mm, some ideas we can think about that they might be doing. They might take steps to minimize RF emissions and ensure that RF is contained in accordance with the TEMPA standards or even go as far as implementing SCIFs. That's, that's why such protocols exist. But at this stage, that's out of scope for this briefing and beyond our standard operational domain. So let's end that here. Uh, we hope this will add to your capabilities. Got speed out there. Uh, special thanks to a whole bunch of people. Um, and all of this is nothing new, really. It's just standing on the shoulders of giants and just sharing my study notes. So thanks to all the people that made this possible. Um, some resources if you want to go sneak that. And that's pretty much it. Questions? Uh, how hard is it to get a ham license? Uh, relatively easy. Um, well, we, we, we should point at the person who gave that talk on uh, hackers should, gave, should get your hem license. Uh, we're sitting right there. Okay, <laughs> How hard is it to get your hem license in, um, say, in the U.S.? It's pretty straightforward. And the kind of the point of the talk that I did that time was all of the interesting stuff, per se, um, unless you want to do, you know, uh, HF work and talk uh, across the ocean to people. Um, you can do all that with a, a technician class license, which is the first level. And so uh, you can go uh, like from the frequency range you were showing, that's included with technician, and you can go all the way up into working with satellites and microwave, and all you need is a technician. So it's, it's you know, there's a little bit of study, but uh, it's, I don't know. Say you uh, took a couple of classes, you could go do the test, and if and you'd be in good shape. Yeah, thanks for that, Gabriel. Yeah. yeah, there's some really interesting things you can do with ham radio. Uh, one is uh, you can use a satellite dish to bounce radio signals off the moon and communicate with people on the other side of the planet. It's it's a really fun thing to do. I I have a uh, four foot dish in the basement. I have yet to get my license. I keep threatening to do so. Giggle keeps kicking me, and so does uh, uh, Hoodie Pony. So thank you, Hoodie Pony, for that presentation. Uh, yeah. Thank you for listening. So cool that you if you have any more questions, please shout them out. Any more questions? No? Okay. Great job. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Our next presentation is at 10.05, so we have about 20 minutes, roughly. So, is that right? No. 30 minutes. So, uh, we'll see you here in 30 minutes. Uh, socialize, get some water, take a break.